Do I have to live up to that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure about the number 42. Uh, we'll figure that out later. Uh, I did come here uh, in the fall of 1973. Uh, I suppose a lot of you guys weren't adults, were not even born in 1973. Uh, <clears throat> um, and the atmosphere here was rather different from what it is now. Uh, if you walked in the front door on the average morning, you would find in the Commonwealth lobby uh, at least four or five people playing guitars and singing uh, with, sometimes with tears rolling down their faces, uh, songs by Bob Dylan and the like of him. Uh, one of the favorite ones, which my wife reminded me of yesterday, was this one. How many times must a man look up before he can see the sky? It was that kind of stuff. Uh, it really, it does. It gets me. songs really are something. Uh, the answer was blowing in the wind all over the place. Uh, On the other hand, uh, there was another uh, and rather more stony um, aspect to it, uh, which um, I suppose could be summed up in the word uh, revolution. Um, uh, it was the Vietnam time. Uh, I don't know how many of you, well, I've said this about 50 times. In the uh, boys' bathroom on the third floor, the, which is very nicely painted, unobjectionably painted, uh, about five layers down there is a very large North Vietnamese flag painted there. And uh, sometime I will, if requested to do so, uh, lead a revolutionary movement to uncover it. <laughs> uh, but there was a lot of that kind of talk also going on here. Uh, hard rain was going to fall as well as the uh, um, nicer Dylan things. Uh, there were a lot of kids, there was a lot of arguments, a lot of things that happened around here of which, um, which teachers uh, uh, would hear that there was really no point in uh, young people listening to old fogies like us, old white fogies, um, who uh, liked Latin and Jane Austen and ridiculously out of place things. Uh, the word relevant was all over the place, and um, uh, we were told very often that we weren't very relevant and uh, that we ought to uh, be quiet and listen to uh, the younger people a lot more. Uh, there was actually a couple of times well, maybe it was only one, but it seemed like about ten, actually. <laughs> when, uh, when the entire school was shut down, we had meetings in every, every one of these rooms on the first couple of floors to see if there was any way in which um, there could be some agreement reached by the older people and the younger people about uh, whether we should actually go on trying to have a school here. Uh, it, was, it was quite a, a knockdown business. <laughs> Um, along with those uh, kinds of that dual character to things, uh, there were some other things which were luckily not so um, categorizable. Uh, in this room here, uh, early on, we had for a while, um, there was a couple of kids who, who really loved soap operas. I spent a lot of time listening to soap operas, perhaps even during school hours, I don't know. Uh, but uh, they really picked up the, the idiom and they wrote soap operas and they were performed them here during lunchtime. Uh, was, uh, and that was a quite a lot of uh, fun. Also, there was one night, one night, or no, it was an, uh, a noontime when we came down here. Nobody knew this was going to happen. This was when we, instead of having a, a, a lunchtime which was in, uh, organized according to a line and you, you kind of came in, ate, and went out more or less continuously, uh, everybody came in and sat down at the same time. And then and school, school uh, kids, um, were waiters and they would come and bring the food and then the ninth graders would, well the first ninth grader, this is characteristic, the first ninth grader usually who got his hands on the food, it was usually he ate it all. And this happened over and over no matter, no matter what old people said. Uh, I guess that's a sign of vitality. <laughs> But one, one, one day we came down here and uh, for lunch, came down that, those stairs, and uh, it was really odd looking because the, this room was totally dark. 
And uh, as we came in, lights went on, but the, but the daylight had been shut out. The tables were all set with white tablecloths and actual silver. And uh, I think they were all uh, boys. We were dressed up in tuxedos with a uh, black tie, and they were our waiters that day. And there were flowers at every table, and there were candles. This was just a spur of the moment. God knows why, but it was absolutely, it was absolutely wonderful. And I forget what we ate. It was probably something quite marvelous. So things like that happened back in the uh, 70s. Uh, I'll have to say that I uh, have liked being, as you may imagine, liked uh, being here uh, enough to stick around all this time because of all the things that I learned by trying to uh, make, make this job of being a teacher uh, work. And I'll give you a, a, a few little instances of how that um, came about. Uh, we have this weekend in the country, a long weekend in the country called Hancock, which I guess uh, almost all of you know about. And uh, back in the old days, it was done in uh, this place that Mr. Merrill owned up in New Hampshire. And uh, there was a we slept in the barn, and then we also slept in a, a large um, other building that had a, a long, uh, well, it wasn't as big as this room, but it was about two thirds as big as this room, in which we our kids slept at night. And, uh, and then at the end of the um, weekend, we would all have to clean the place up. And so uh, this long barn-like room, uh, one single open stretch, had to be swept. Well, I was in charge of uh, getting the place swept um, on this time that I'm remembering. And I remember, I forgot to bring a prop. Uh, I, remember, I remember watching this kid uh, stand roughly sort of about here maybe, and he had a broom in his hand, and it was going like this. <laughs> in short, he wandered around, accomplishing actually nothing whatever. He had never heard of what it was like to use a broom. And uh, I was raised in the kind of town where we all, I didn't sweep my own room, but we certainly raked the leaves. And uh, so I taught him how to sweep up. I had the experience of teaching a guy how to use a broom. It's, it's, you know, so you start, you start at one edge, you know, and you work, you work your way steadily like a military campaign, you know, and um, gradually you reach the... So that was one thing, so I thought, and you know, that's a pretty good metaphor for uh, writing an essay, if you want. <laughs> um, I had a 10th grade class uh, one of the first couple of years, and um, I asked them the same questions over and over and over again. Uh, there, were, there were certain things that I wanted them to pay attention to, and when we gathered up a certain number of things and we'd written them out on the board, I wanted to have some deductions made. So I asked them the same questions, maybe the same seven or eight or nine questions, over and over and over again. And after two and a half months of this, which you might think was a little excessive, uh, I said, aren't you sick and tired of all these questions that I've been asking you? And they said, oh, God, are we sick and tired of these? Oh, geez, let's... So I said, all right, you tell me what the questions were, I'll write them down on the board, and when we're done with that, I'll never ask you those questions again. And they could not remember <laughs> even one, even one of those questions. So, so I was totally delighted. I said, all right, I've got you for the rest of the year. That was a great moment. Uh, Another, uh, another great moment, which was quite different in character, was uh, toward the end of a 10th grade year, um, we always read Macbeth at the end of the year. And uh, so I was going through a last uh, preparatory class for the final exam. And it was going to be on a, a metaphor-soaked um, passage uh, at the end of the uh, thing. I forget which one. <laughs> and um, uh, everybody was listening pretty carefully and asking questions. And then this one young lady named Jane Litter one of my all-time favorite people. Uh, uh, she was not being very nice that day. She was looking t terribly annoyed. And, and pretty soon she started to ask uh, questions, which basically were, how can you expect, how in the world, Mr. Davis, can you expect us to know how to interpret such a stupid thing as a metaphor? And we've been talking about this all year. <laughs> but, uh, and she, she then proceeded to ask a, a series so it was an attack. It was an attack, and everybody knew that. Uh, 
my wife now, who was thinking of taking a job of this sort, was listening to this thing, and it almost convinced her not to ever try to become a teacher. But she asked a series of about 14 or 15 questions, uh, and they were, uh, she had me on the ropes. So I tried desperately to answer these questions, and I, 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 I hope I did a reasonable job. But at the end of the questions, I thought, it occurred to me uh, that she, if you put those questions together, you would have an absolutely marvelous uh, demonstration or essay about exactly what metaphors are, how they work, and what you can get out of them. It was a brilliant, a brilliant thing. She was only doing it because she was pissed off. But, but, you know, she struck to the heart of the whole matter. It was a marvelous thing. Uh, another thing I'll tell you about, uh, my daughter and uh, two sons have gone here. And my, uh, my daughter, Theo, uh, well, I was talking to her one day about a class that I had where I couldn't get anybody to say anything. Nobody would say anything. These happened all the time. Uh, and uh, it, drove, it drives you nuts if you're a teacher. So uh, I, I, I asked, what, what in the hell is going on? Why were they, because they, they'd been wonderful the day before. How can they be like this in one day and the next? And she said, uh, I, I believe I quote, uh, don't worry. There's not a thing you can do about it. It's all social, and you'll never hear a word of it. You'll never understand a single thing. And that, that has proved to be quite true. Uh, as a final instance of this particular bunch of things, um, I, we read Passage to India very often in 12th grade. Uh, and uh, very early on in my career here, um, on a spring day when it was kind of warm, and we had another one of those days where nobody was saying much of anything. And uh, this was a 12th grade class. And um, so uh, I forget exactly how that thing ended up. But the day after uh, we had this unsatisfactory class, this is about the end where the, it's all about the Hindu part of things. Uh, I received a little present. Uh, it was a piece of candy of some sort. And it had a note on it. And I, I actually saved the note by, uh, uh, it was an inspiration. To say that I, the note reads like this: When you eat this candy bar, you will be eating it, but you will not have eaten it yet. <laughs> However, you already ate it, as did I and all the other members of the universe centuries ago. Good luck, love, Emily. <laughs> so, I think the moral of that story is that essays don't tell the whole story. Uh, there were some. Um, one of the amazing things that happened here over the years uh, is you got to hear uh, veteran faculty people say things which, um, I don't quite know what verb to give it, but I'll tell you what they were. Uh, Charlie Chatfield, uh, one of the finest people I have ever, ever, ever known, uh, would just let these things fall, and then when you were sitting there shocked by them, he would walk away so you couldn't answer ask him anything about it. And this is one of those things. He just said one day, oh, well then, you know, death is the mother of beauty said that. Now I have, it just struck me as one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. <laughs> Does anybody want to die? No. Uh, but of course it's quite true. Besides he was quoting Wallace Stevens, so it has to be true. <laughs> uh, another one he said was writing is aggression, he said. And I always thought of it, well because I got beat up a lot when I was a kid, that's why I became a s scholar, you know. So I thought, you know, it was a way to avoid aggression, but it, is, but it isn't. Writing is aggression, you can take that one home and think about it. And then I'll uh, quote Charles Merrill, who uh, he said this, and I think he wrote it also in the Walled Garden, but I'm quoting it anyway. He quoted it sometimes. He said, you, and this is another one of those things that I thought, I've never heard a dumber thing in my life. He said, you, because once you get out of school, you get to be free, right? That's why you graduate. You will be taking exams, he said, strictly graded for the whole of your life. What do you think of that? <laughs> Everybody here who has children will probably know what I mean. <laughs> okay, uh, just I'll tell you just a few more things. There have been some uh, dramatic exchanges with students that um, uh, count for a lot, or tell you a lot. Uh, one of them happened uh, last week um, involving a person named Gabe Weinreb, who some of you may know. Uh, we were reading, we are just finished, it was the last day, we finished uh, Hamlet, and uh, it was a little extra time, and uh, I started to think, well, if you, I asked them if you could quote a, a thing or two um, that somehow struck you that you, uh, as really at the heart of things or something that you thought was really interesting. Uh, 
what would it be? Well, they didn't have... They then started to ripple through their books as if they had never read the play. <laughs> uh, I was thinking, because we were reading the last few pages, I was thinking they would light on something like The Rest is Silence, or uh, Good Night, Sweet Prince, and Flights of Angels Tend Thee to Thy Rest. Sing Thee to Thy Rest. But uh, what this guy picked out was uh, two words from the next to last page, which were exit left. <laughs> Pretty good. One of the happiest moments I ever, ever had, uh, and my most triumphant one, uh, was with a kid named Andre Jones. Uh, it was in room 3C, and the history room. And uh, I forget what the, uh, there was an argument going on, but there was also a storm brewing outside, and it starts to rain, uh, really dark crowds and stuff like that. And uh, this guy, Andre, um, said something which was, uh, well, in the religious sense of the word, it was unforgivable. And I said, Andre, uh, if, you, if you say things like that, God's going to strike you dead, you know. And at that very moment, there was this enormous thunderbolt that right outside, right outside the window of that thing. So we, we were all shocked, and all the rest of us laughed, but Andre was not amused. <laughs> Finally, I have to tell you about Isaac and his light bulb. We have uh, a thing at Hancock where by faculty members have to sleep somewhere in the reasonable vicinity of uh, the younger people. And uh, this guy, Isaac Slavitt, um, who was a bit of a wise guy, uh, was sitting at, was in a, in a room with three, uh, two or three other kids in it. And you're supposed to, there's a lights out time. So I said, lights out. I went around and I turned out with the, uh, no, I asked them to put out the lights. And then, of course, I went around 10 minutes later and the lights were still all on, so I, I went around and I turned them off myself. And uh, then I went around 10 minutes later and I, the lights were all back on again. So I went around and I yelled at them and I turned off the lights some more. And, uh, and I went back again and the lights came on in his room. So I went in and I took the light bulb out of the thing <laughs> and I walked back to my room. And the trouble with that was that Isaac came after me and there uh, followed in the room I was going to sleep in, right next door to that, a, uh, a, a fight. I had an actual knockdown fight with Isaac Slavitt, who was about five times stronger than me, and uh, about the light bulb. It was, it was up here, it was struggling. And, uh, but he couldn't get hold of it, because I had a pretty good hold of it. And in the end, um, he dragged it down to where we both were, and... Uh, and then uh, I looked in his eyes, and he looked in mine, because I, I thought I was going to get smashed. And, and he gave me this little smile, and he let go. <laughs> that, that was one of the nicest things that ever happened to me. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was sweet. It was wonderful sweet. All right, I'm going to say just one last thing. I'm going to quote... Uh, it was either the first or second year I was teaching here, and it was a 12th grade class. And it was a warm spring day. And nobody, it was one of those, one of those things where nobody wanted to say anything. And, uh, and they didn't. And um, I forget what we were talking about. Anyway, the bell rang, and uh, in a rather defeated condition, I, um, I looked into the eyes of this young lady who was sitting in the front row. A person who, I don't know what she was doing here. She looked like a perfect Southern California girl. Twilight Field was her name. I guess it still is her name. And, uh, and I said, God, uh, something like, uh, I don't know about this stuff. And she says, yeah, she said, it's all pretty boring until you start to think about it. <laughs> and I'll have to say, if I, ha if I were building a school again and I had something to put up over the door as the motto of the school, that is what I would put up.